Hello there. I'm Rob Martinez, state historian of New Mexico, and this is New Mexico History in 10 Minutes. Before Reyes Lopez Tijerina, before the Alianza Federal de Mercedes, there were the Gorras Blancas. In the 1880s, 1890s, the influence of the Santa Fe Ring was immense, and it had infiltrated uh, the state government in New Mexico with corruption and unethical uh, business dealings and political favors. In San Miguel County, where Las Vegas, New Mexico is, there were some major problems when the um, land grant of Las Vegas started to be um, infiltrated and uh, overtaken by businessmen, ranchers, politicians, and attorneys who were corrupt and who were uh, intensely connected to the Santa Fe Ring. The land grants at places like Las Vegas and Mora, which were granted during colonial times and Mexican period, um, they were communal land grants, which means people got some land, but there was also common lands. Common lands where everyone had access to pasture lands for grazing, water, timber, and essentially all the things needed to uh, survive and thrive in a rural agrarian society, which New Mexico had been for centuries. With the arrival of American legal and business practices, as well as the railroad, things start to change. The symbol of this American expansion into New Mexico's Mexican uh, rural population uh, was barbed wire fences. In the colonial times and Mexican period, there were land grants and people had access to common lands, but they had their own land. And there were encroachments and there were uh, legal claims that were challenged by Pueblo people or Hispano people. But there were no barbed wire fences, which limited access to all those natural resources that people and animals need to live. But what starts to happen is all of these... Uh, business people and ranchers start to grab up uh, the common lands of uh, the uh, area around Las Vegas, the Las Vegas land grant. And it starts to put stress on the communities of poorer Nuevo Mexicanos, the Hispano people, the Mexican people of New Mexico in that area. Well, things start to come to uh, a head in 1889, when a group of Hispanos uh, organized under uh, the name Las Gorras Blancas, uh, the white caps or the white hats. And what they do, they start to introduce some ultra-legal um, methods to challenge the Santa Fe Ring and those unethical businessmen who are encroaching on their lands. They start to cut the barbed wire. Uh, Cases start to increase in the area of Las Vegas, where uh, these gorras blancas start to uh, attack this symbol of uh, capitalism, if you will, in that area. Um, three Hispanos are arrested uh, and charged with cutting barbed wire fences, and ultimately uh, they're released because there's a fear that the community is going to attack the jail if they're not let go. About a hundred people gather, and you start to see that this movement has great public support in San Miguel County. Ultimately, um, some of the major players uh, in this uh, drama include uh, District Attorney Miguel Salazar. He is in cahoots with some of the politicos in Santa Fe and in San Miguel County, and he is involved in supporting uh, the um, American uh, ranchers and businessmen and politicians who are involved in this uh, illegal land grab 
the uh, taking of common lands in Las Vegas. So what starts to happen is they start to uh, uh, try to counter the Gorras Blancas. Uh, two brothers, Juan Jose Herrera and Pablo Herrera, they are implicated as leaders of the Gorras Blancas. And ultimately, uh, they are also arrested. Uh, but again, um, the, the three witnesses who supposedly have seen them committing these so-called crimes disappear. And some believe the Gorras Blancas made the witnesses disappear. Well, this is around 1889 and into 1890. And the main targets of the uh, Gorras Blancas, again, are uh, barbed wire fences, but also what they considered barbed wire people. Uh, the uh, wealthy people who are taking these lands and they're, they're grazing anywhere between 25,000 to 40,000 head of cattle, whereas your poor Nuevo Mexicanos have about 15 or 20 head of cattle. Uh, they can't compete. They, they are uh, small players against these uh, wealthy uh, estate builders of the Gilded Age. Ultimately, uh, the Herrera brothers are released because there are no witnesses. What we see then is the uh, Gorras Blancas in 1890. They, um, they change the focus of their activities and they put them on the railroad and they start attacking um, timber and uh, uh, transportation. And even the workers who are building the railroad, they threaten them, they, they uh, coerce them and tell them they should charge more money. Um, they make veiled threats and not so veiled threats against not only the workers, but uh, the foremen and the owners of these operations that if uh, they don't stop, they will disappear too. So this is the atmosphere uh, in San Miguel County in 1890. Um, the uh, Gorras Blancas, uh, the attention of their activities were brought to the governor. The governor actually goes to Las Vegas to address the problem. At first, he's uh, sympathetic to the targets of the Las Gorras Blancas. Uh, but on a second trip, he actually um, holds a town hall meeting and he's shocked to find out that at least half the town uh, support the Gorras Blancas. Uh, and that includes the wealthy classes. Well, he's not sure what to do at this point. Um, he appeals to federal authorities who respond that um, this is his problem. It's a state problem and the uh, federal government will not get involved unless the uh, local territorial government loses control of the situation. But one report that is made uh, about the situation says some very insulting things about the Mexican people of New Mexico, saying something like, uh, the, the Mexican people of New Mexico, except for about 5% of them, are the most ignorant people on earth. And uh, the argument is that they are a uh, prey to uh, being manipulated by these leaders of this movement. Miguel Salazar himself at one point, at, Miguel Salazar at one point states that these Gorras Blancas are part of, of movements that are uh, anarchical, revolutionary, and even communist. So this is the state of affairs until uh, around 1891 when um, uh, Juan Jose Herrera is appointed probate judge and uh, his brother Pablo becomes a member of the territorial legislature. It's quite interesting. They're trying to uh, make a difference within the system to help the poorer people of New Mexico. Ultimately, it does not go well. Pablo leaves a uh, state government and he's, he says that um, the time he spent in territorial prison was more, was more pleasant than the time he spent with the territorial government and that um, he saw more corruption in the territorial government than he ever saw in the halls of the territorial prison. Well, ultimately, by 1891, uh, the influence of Las Gorras Blancas starts to wane. Uh, where 
1890, uh, you had masked horsemen riding through the streets of Las Vegas, handing out uh, pamphlets uh, called um, uh, Nuestra Plataforma, our platform, our message. Um, by 1891, their influence is weakened. Um, Pablo is shot uh, by uh, an enemy of the Gorras Blancas, and ultimately, the, the movement comes to an end. But this movement, uh, the Gorras Blancas, was obviously a response to the Santa Fe Ring, which was in full force in the state government and in rural parts of New Mexico. It was a real um, radical grassroots movement that um, challenged uh, the uh, systems of uh, government, economics, and uh, politics that were starting to make uh, significant changes in the lives of New Mexico's Hispano-Mexican population between the years 1850 and 1890. Some have argued that the Santa Fe Ring and uh, those associated with it were merely trying to create a territory that would be considered suitable to become a state. And there's uh, some uh, significance to that argument. But there can be no doubt that the uh, Goras Blancas were a real powerful response to real and powerful threats to a way of life in New Mexico that had been in place for 300 years. That's it for now. See you next time. Adios.